In this video, I'm going to be going over exactly how I approach maintaining several different ambitions. I'm also going to be going over the framework that I've started using that helps balance all of these. Hello! We are making jam today because I never make jam. This is all about new experiences. I had a conversation with my girlfriend, which was illuminating. I tried to relate to her on how we see the world. I said, picture a map that is blank and picture yourself walking through the map. And when you walk through an area, it comes into color and things get sketched in and you know what's in there only once you've passed through it. You're essentially wandering through the map, looking blindly for treasure. And you're most likely only gonna see that treasure when the map is completely filled out. And she kind of looked confused for a second and told me that, no, that's not at all how she sees the world. She sees a skill tree, like in a video game. Like everything is a skill with steps that lead to greater steps down the skill branch. And it's an infinite amount of skills and you could pick any one and get incredibly good at any random array of skills and you have your whole life to do so. And I thought, that's way better than my map version. My approach has always been one of very, I'd say it's like an overachiever's mindset without actually getting anywhere. And I thought I was the only one for a while, but it started to become clear that a lot of people have this experience with things they want to do with their life. Ooh. The jam should be of thickened consistency at this point. Is it thickened? Uh, who knows? Yeah, we'll call that done. Achievement get. Jam has thickened. The skill tree idea. The, the idea that you can look at life as an infinite possibility of skill acquisition and achievement is wonderful. It's beautiful. So it really stuck with me. And we had this conversation right before going on a week long trip. And the whole week, I just fixated on that thing the whole time. And I suggested we make our own skill trees. By the end of it, I had basically just fully fleshed out this crazy huge array of life goals and skills I'd want to eventually try. So I am making jam because I've never made jam before. Every time I would do something new, I would do it because I wanted some fulfillment from it. Everything had to be, you know, I'm not going to go for a run because I want to be fit. I'm going to go for a run because I want to be the best runner in the world. I'm not just going to play chess with my dad. I want to train to be a grandmaster someday. Everything had to be done at the utmost pinnacle. This doesn't come from anyone other than me. There is no one in my life who has tried to push me towards being excellent. It's just me and my own insecurity. Maybe it's a lot to be sharing with the internet, but I got a point to this. All right. All right. We got to pour this stuff. I'm gonna put the mic down. This is a terrible setup. All right. That is a jar of jam. <gasps> I made some jam because there is no point. I've never made jam. I would never do jam. This shouldn't be part of some training arc to become the best chef in the world. It should just be some dude in his kitchen making some jam. Not everything has to be done at the utmost pinnacle. It is dumb that I need to try and figure that out for myself, but this is where it gets interesting. Personally, I'm not sold on the idea that you need to completely abandon ambition, but there's a difference between ambition and insecurity. If you're not getting anywhere in your own ambitions, personally, I'm of, I'm of the opinion that it is insecure security and your real ambitions are so difficult and so daunting and so terrifying that you're not going after those ones. So I have several ambitions, things that I want to do someday that I might get around to at some point. The skill tree is inherently about putting those things on the back burner, but with accountability. The beauty of it is it's essentially smart goals, but you remove the time element. S stands for specific. This goal has to be narrowed in, pinpointed. The skill tree functions in the sense that step one for stretching is the first goal is just once, then the second goal is twice, then we'll go up to four times and, and double each time until every goal is narrow, you know exactly what you need to do. Measurable is you can measure the progress. So going up step by step in a way that is specific and measurable means that you can tangibly feel your progression. Achievable is an incredibly important step. It has to be reasonable. If step one is a hundred days of stretching, in that hundred days, you're not gonna feel any progression. You're gonna be like, I didn't reach my goal. I didn't reach my goal. I didn't reach my goal. If we amp up the scale a bit, if step one is write a book, then you're not gonna feel any sense of progression. 
if you've gone from you had an idea, you fleshed it out, you did some world building, you wrote a first draft, you wrote a second draft, you edit it, send it to an editor, and then step one is when you've published your book, that's the problem there. It doesn't feel achievable because it's not without all those steps before it. And R stands for relevant. The best part about this is you only need to put branches on your skill tree that are relevant to you. If you don't want to learn the piano, if you don't want to learn the piano, you don't have to. That doesn't even need to go on your skill tree. All you need to do is things that are relevant to you. Part of the accountability is your skill tree, if you've done it right, if you've planned all the steps preceding your giant ambition, should just be an easy roadmap to tack onto when you can, for lack of a better word. It's not necessarily a tracker in the day-to-day. -day. That's habits and that kind of stuff, and we'll get into that in a second. But your skill tree is like your big life goal, ambition, everything is on there. For example, in my case, fitness stuff is almost completely fleshed out. I got marathons, ultra marathons, things I want to try someday that I'm not actively pursuing right now, but they're definitely in the back of my head. Putting it down takes it out the back of my head so that when I can sit down and focus on something, I don't have in the back of my head while I'm reading, shouldn't I be training for an ultra marathon right now? None of that, none of that. I can do that in five years, 10 years, whatever, you know, and away from the fitness section, schooling. I started a degree in 2019, 2020. I've never finished that degree. I don't even have the goal of finishing that degree but in that level let's say in that game level of life of going to university to get an art degree i did do some progress i did one year the rest the remaining three years are still grayed out they might be grayed out for the rest of my life but to have a path that i went down is just as valuable as having a path that i completed xp points going up baby doesn't matter that i don't get awards like game awards or life affirming success because of getting a degree or something like that it's just you're tracking your life you're tracking your progress so that if you ever have the toxic thought that we all have that like i'm 23 and i haven't gotten anywhere eh, there's a giant skill tree with things lit up of all your successes and if you don't value them right now i'm sure someday you will because i'm not sure i'm gonna do this my whole life i really want to say that when i'm 80 and things are breaking down i can look at this giant lit up skill tree and it doesn't matter what things are lit up it could be made jam a thousand times i think the pride of having that stuff in front of you is incredibly valuable because i've heard the advice of like i want to be on my deathbed and i don't want to have any regrets well your brain isn't shouldn't have a constant list of regrets it shouldn't have a constant list of ambitions and things you want to do in there you can't keep track of that stuff so no wonder by the time you reach your deathbed you're like i don't know what i've done I don't know what I wanted to do, but I'm really disappointed. That feeling of disappointment might just be disorganization. If you actually want to get to your deathbed and not have any regrets, well, having a, a tracker, a tangible list of things you've done and didn't do but decided not to do, I mean, that's so useful. That's an actual way of measuring happiness and fulfillment. You can say you wanna be fulfilled by the end of your life, but I mean, how do you actually measure that? I think this is a way of measuring that. Everything you've ever wanted to do that felt too ambitious, you can just jot down and then come back to it when you have the time or the genuine desire to pursue it. So for example, on my skill tree, I have an incredible amount of physical things I wanna try out, like powerlifting, bodybuilding, all these things that don't really mix well together if you wanna do them at the same time. That's the problem. Every few months, you have an ambition and it directly opposes another ambition you had a few months ago. And the shiny object syndrome drives you to want to go to the new thing, which means you've abandoned the thing you did already. What is toxic in that mindset isn't picking up and doing something else. It's thinking that you failed if you haven't completed the initial ambition. You still went down that road. And the next time you go down that road, you can pick up where you left off. You're not starting at zero every time. My my mistake for a long time was thinking, okay, well, let me give you an example. Every time I would go camping with my girlfriend and her family, it would be the same week, the same month, every year at the same place, often the same campsite. So every year I'd sit by the fire and I'd think, last year I had this new idea for a book and I started working on it. And as the year went by, I dropped off the idea, it didn't work, blah, blah, blah. I sit down by the fire and I think, damn, I never wrote that book, but I have a new idea for a book. And so so on and so on and so on. After about three years of that, I sit down and I'm like, God damn it. Like, 
three years go by. I haven't written a book. I had three years to write at least one book and I didn't. And that really gnawed at me. So I sit down uh, last year and I promise myself, all right, this time next year, I'm sitting in front of the fire. I will have written at least a rough draft or be ready to publish a final draft of a book. I think I promised myself that the book would be done in a year, which is dumb because that's not feasible. So I just made myself that promise. I go away. I was super diligent. I was writing every day and I wrote a 30,000 page rough draft and I read it and it was garbage. And it just took the wind out my sails because I realized I was running out of time to finish my book. But the thing is, uh, a few weeks ago was when uh, the camping trip was again. And I'm sitting down in the fire and I'm thinking, I have not written a book, but I've never written a 30,000 page rough draft in my life before. That is an achievement. It's not what I set out to do. But it got me thinking every time I set, I set my sights on going down the path of writing a book, I had always gotten a little further than last time. And in my ego-driven ambition, I'd never noticed the progress itself. I was just focused on the end. This skill tree idea is the ultimate solution for me because it makes everything a tangible step. And every time you hit a tangible step, you are going down the road. Whether it takes you 10 years to write one book or not, it doesn't matter. You have tangible progress. The effect this shift had on me was that it transformed my inner drive from being desperate to being more enjoyable. I had a, a drive for having fun in my day. So now the drive has shifted from desperately trying to achieve all these things in my head that I think will make me happy to having a drive towards going down down a certain path, the curiosity of that path or the enjoyment of going down that path. It's a completely different approach. The mindset shift that my girlfriend gave me and now you is only part of the equation. I think it was all part of the cosmic soup of ideas in my head at the time. I was reading The Game of Life and How to Play it by Florence Scovoshin. The idea is that you are programming your mind in a sense with the things you say and the things you believe and the right programming can get you to fully form an optimistic ideal in your head. And the wrong programming can create the wrong ideal in your head. So if you think about your brain as an interface with inputs and outputs, and every input directly reflects the output, if you're not careful, your thought process can create a causal loop in which you believe something bad, something bad happens, and you believe that only more bad can happen because you've seen bad happen, and so on and so on and so on. You could also go a bit worse in the case of myself. You can believe you aren't capable of doing something, try to do something, and because you believed you couldn't do it, you could couldn't do it, which proved your own point. The book also proposes this idea that you win the game of life once you completed the square, which would be health, wealth, love, and perfect self-expression. These are excellent values, I think, to evaluate your life. If you have all four of these, according to the author, you would win at life. I would agree. I think that there's a lot of variability within all of those things, and that there's quite a lot of room to play with within all of those. In the category of love, you have romantic relationships, you have friendships, you have family, you have love of something, love of life. You have all of these things that can be explored. So if you look at it as a, a square that expands into a skill tree, well, every corner expands into its own branches and you can explore different areas as progression. Another excellent example would be in the health aspect, you have mental health, physical health. Within those two categories, you have a world of experiences to try. There's so much to explore within those four values that your, <laughs> your life is set. You have so much to explore and, and that's the key, the key word really, explore. This is essentially where ambition and doubt start creeping in because you legitimately could do anything. That is the blessing and the curse of life. You could go down any branch on this tree and it's tempting to want to go down all of them. Honestly, I think you should want to go down all of these branches. I think the point is that everything should be learned and experienced and I needed to learn that I could only do some of what I wanted some of the time. You can have everything you want. You can do everything you want to do. You just can't do it every day. Personally, I've tried doing everything every day. I've tried daily routines that in 
involve an hour of writing, an hour of sculpting, an hour of recording. And it just gets so much and you get spread so thin. I got spread so thin. Everything started feeling hollow and it did a disservice to everything I was trying to do. And on the contrary, if, you, if I tried to do one thing every day, I kind of would get bored and I'd start seeing the grass as greener on the other side. There's a balance to it. And that balance doesn't have to be desperate. It doesn't have to be clingy. You can look at it as which skill am I trying to improve today? You find a goal. Let's say you want to write a book because this seems to be the big example of this video. Let's say you want to write a book. I would say the most difficult hurdle isn't writing every day, is getting yourself to sit down and start writing every day. So that's the focus. Start the habit. You sit down every day and you don't allow yourself to go past two minutes. So open your laptop or get a piece of paper and a pen and you sit down. That's the first few weeks. You just get a paper and a pen you sit down, sit there for two minutes thinking and leave or something like that. And then eventually you get to the point where you write every day because now you've you've built in the habit of sitting down to write. All you need to do is add on writing. And then after that has become easy, then you can up the time a little bit, maybe by a minute, maybe by five minutes, whatever it takes until you can consistently do it for a long time. Let's say hypothetically 90 days really is how long it takes to build a habit. Well, after 90 days, you don't even need to try anymore. It's part of your life. It's easier to do one push-up a day than a hundred push-ups every day. And so the person who started with one push-up every day isn't going to burn out. And by the time he can do a push-up every day, I mean, what's adding a push-up every couple weeks, right? Like consistency is key. Your ego gets in the way of that. My ego has gotten in the way of that. It's like, well, if I'm sitting down to write for 20 minutes, then why not an hour every day? Stephen King can do it for three, four hours. So it's like you aren't there yet, not because you aren't capable of it, but because you haven't started the progression yet. Progression should be the key point of this video. I don't know if I, I did justice in the editing, but progression is, progression is life. <laughs> Another key motivator is gamification. Game, video games, board games, TV, they tap into your internal most primal craving. If you crave success and progression, which you do, you're gonna like video games because they are a simulated version of that. They simulate progression, they simulate status, they simulate reward, and so it's incredibly addictive. Life is like that. You just need to find a way to make that easier than sitting down to watch TV or play a video game. One of those things that did it for me was competition. After after my year of university, I went to work at Loblaws pushing carts. Uh, there was this guy there called Parker. He was an enormous gentleman. Over the years when I tell stories about him, he's gone up in height. I don't know how tall he was, maybe 6'2", maybe 6'3", but every time I tell the story, it like adds an inch. So by the time I'm telling you this story, in my head, Parker's like 6'8", 6'9", just this giant tower of a man. He was huge. He was like just a big farm lad looking guy. And uh, he would push carts and he did not enjoy pushing carts, but he'd become incredibly efficient at it. At one point, you know, we're working a busy weekend and I ask him, how many carts can you push in a row? Like you, you row, row up the carts and you push it in one go to go inside. And he said he did about 45. And I was like, I can absolutely do that. So motivated by my desire to measure up or at least, you know, or maybe go past this guy in competition, I load up like 41 carts and I push it with all I have. And I'm basically perpendicular to the ground, just pushing this thing. He comes up and with one hand, he just goes away. I didn't realize the parameters were one armed cart pushes. Anyway, that humbling experience revealed that I hated pushing carts. I hated my job. But the second some guy says, how many carts can you push? Or I ask him, how many carts can you push? And he gives me a number. I immediately want to thwart that number. Maybe it's just me, or maybe you have that internal desire to win in competition or at least measure up to someone who is quite good in a certain field. That kind of stuff turns a boring, you know, part-time, low-pay job into a playground of competition. You can do that with anything. I talk a lot about the beauty of the skill tree is you can go down a road, you don't even need to finish, and then stop and go down another road and you can pick up where you left off, which means everything takes longer to get to, but you don't have this feeling of starting over every time. A great way to go down these paths is by the time the first thing you set out to do, like go on a run every day, by the time that's gone from being something you have to force yourself to do to something you have trouble not doing, that's the perfect time to switch because it's habit 
Now it's part of you. Now that it's part of you, it's going to be difficult to get rid of it, especially if you maintain the habit for years. I've been going to the gym for eight years now. I've been sculpting for eight years now. Even when I try to stop, I can't. That's perfect because now I can switch my focus to something else. It also helps that a, a skill tree like this is more or less of an organizational tool. It's like a tracker. I have several trackers on my wall. As you can probably tell, they're not all filled in because at a certain point they get rigid. Every day of the week I had different things to do and I thought, great, it means I don't have to do the same thing every day and I get specific days in the week to focus on specific things. But it got too rigid, too stringent and any red, any amount of time where I didn't do exactly what I was supposed to do was incredibly discouraging. The skill tree is different. It allows you to go down a path and then stop and pick it up whenever you want to. That's the best part. In the lifting category, so look, you have my name, health, strength, weightlifting, and that branches off into different categories. But in the strength training, bench squat, deadlift. First achievement, bench 135 pounds. It took me quite a while to get there, maybe three, four years. First achievement is bench 135. I'm really proud of that because I got there when the bar was really difficult. Doesn't matter that that was eight years ago now. That doesn't matter because this is like an 80 year long project. Jam is still very hot, but. Oh, I was supposed to crush them. Blah. Whatever, I'm sure it's good. It looks, that looks delicious. I'm supposed to let it cool. Forget that. We have bread. That's some good jam. <sighs> Thanks for watching.